So I want to welcome you back for Module 2, The Web. In this video series, five parts, we're going to go ahead and look at the basic computer concepts around the web. Now understand that when we talk about the web, some people intermingle the terms internet and web or internet and World Wide Web. Or today, folks just combine them, the cool kids, and they call it the interwebs. So we're going to take a look at components of the web in general. Our lesson objectives, again, this is going to be a five-part video series. In the first part, I will look at the role of the web, the internet, and daily life. We'll learn more about websites, web pages, web apps, e-commerce, information literacy, also called digital literacy. Okay, It applies not only to utilizing your devices, but how we utilize the web, where we store data, a bunch of other things. And then finally, We'll look at how to conduct an online research and how to better use browsers to do that searching. So in this first part, we'll look at defining web browsing terms, explain the purpose of a top-level domain, what that means, and describe internet standards that make all of this stuff work. It is those international internet standards that allow the internet to conduct itself with common protocols, common encryption methods, etc. And when everyone's doing the same thing throughout the world, that's what makes the internet or the interwebs work. So as we look at terms, the internet, notice, is a global collection of millions of computers linked together to share information worldwide. Now, when we talk about this, we're not only talking about computers, but we're talking about routers. We're talking about the hardware, the foundation, if you will, of the equipment that allows us to serve up web pages, websites, for you to browse the web, for you to shop and do e-commerce and things like that. A web page, of course, is simply an electronic document. Now, today, we've gone away from utilizing HTML and combine it with things like JavaScript and Cascade style sheets and databases. So it used to be web pages were very static and now they're dynamic because the content is being stored in a database. It can be used multiple places. It just makes the internet work better. And I personally would not have to go update every web page within my website. So that brings us to website, which is simply a collection of web pages. Now today, websites are very different than they used to be. It's not just about the static web pages but it's about interacting with a website. Maybe like for Amazon, where we go out and we order items from the web, and we'll be talking about that more. Now, in order to access web pages and websites, we need to use a specialized application called a web browser. Web browsers are designed to display web pages. Most of you are probably familiar with the ones that I have here, Google Chrome, I've got the logo there, and Firefox. For you Mac users, there's Apple Safari or Safari. And then currently, Microsoft has a brand new one out called Edge. Now, what's interesting is their version of Edge is actually using some Google technology to make it work better. As we go through these web pages and browsers, we navigate by moving from one web page to another or from a tool to a web page. We usually start when we hit that first URL and we type in www.google.com. We're going to go to Google's home page and then we can get to subsequent pages from there. Not only can we utilize typing, but we can also click on components of the web page to get where we want to get. And we do that by hyperlinks. Now, hyperlinks back in the day used to be like this one that I've presented in purple. You could tell it was a hyperlink because it had an underline because it was a different color. But today we can link with words or graphics or other things that are content in the web page to basically get where we want to get or to get more information about what it is that we're clicking on. What makes all this work is the idea of a uniform resource locator. Okay, Now, a URL is really nothing more than an address. It is an address that's easy to remember, like your home address or your apartment address. I know my address, and it is unique 
to everywhere in the world. You're not going to find another, for example, 555 Southwest 11th Street, Bend, Oregon, 97701. That makes it unique. And we have to do the same thing on the Internet in order to get where we want to get. Now, the nice thing about a uniform resource locator is that it's easy to remember. We don't have to remember the numbers behind the address. We just have to remember www.amazon.com and we can get there. It's the magic that happens behind the scenes that makes all this work. So now that we know that you know, we can type in a, a URL, a web address in the address bar, that's what most people call it, what that does is it goes out to a server that's serving the website and the web pages for that particular website, web service, whatever it is. So a web server is a high-end computer, and I've got an example of one right here, this web server right here. So it hosts different websites. It can host multiple websites and multiple pages from the website. And what I do is I make a request out to the Internet through my Internet service provider through the browser that I'm using and asking for it to present the web page back to me. Now, the interesting thing is what we use is the URL, but every URL corresponds with a unique IP address, an Internet Protocol address. Okay, it's a set, of no, a set of four numbers when we talk about IP version four. It's a set of four numbers from zero to 255. And everything on the internet is unique. Now, I will mention that with IPv4, we end up with like 4.2 billion possible addresses. And now that the internet has gotten so big, that didn't work. So we've gone to IPv6. Why six? Because it's six of those octets, of those sets of numbers, okay, and it also uses special numbers, hexadecimal, within the IPv6. Now, the great thing about that is we could give a unique IP address, a unique location on the internet to every atom on the face of the earth and do that to about a hundred more earths. That's how many unique IP addresses we have when we went from four octets to eight octets. And here's an example right here of an IPv4 address where a user is doing a query using DNS, domain name services. All that basically is is a table, and there's a lot of DNS servers on the internet, but it's a table that knows if somebody types in google.com, I'm gonna take it to the IP address I have for Google. Now Google is so big that they have thousands and thousands of unique IP addresses for google.com and they try to place their site as close to the end user as they can to make it faster, to make it more efficient. If I make a call over the internet to some website in China, it's going to take a while for it to get back. Now when we talk about a while on the internet, we're talking about milliseconds, but we might actually see a genuine difference between calling up Google in the United States and calling up a search engine in China, okay? So all we have to remember is the www represents the web address, the World Wide Web. So we're saying go out to the World Wide Web, find this site in my example called internet at a toplevelDomain.com, and we'll talk more about top-level domains in a minute. So now you understand that each of those addresses is associated with one or more routable IP internet protocol addresses, similar to your address at home. More about browsing terms, so an address bar, I've got an example right up here. Here is an address bar for the Chrome browser. This is where we would type in that address that we want, and it then converts it, goes out, finds the IP address, and presents back the web page that we typed in there. Now as we do this, to make the internet more efficient. Now this really held value in the internet when we talked about a 56 kilobyte, kilobit, sorry, 56 kilobit dial-up connection. Boy, the internet was slow. You would call up a website, you'd go have dinner, you'd come back and the website would be ready for you to read. That's how long it literally took. But what happens as we navigate websites 
is the browser keeps a copy called a cache, okay? A copy called a cache on our computer for all or some portions of the website that we're visiting. And the reason for that is then the next time we visit the site, instead of having to go out and ask the web server for the information again, a lot of that material is cached on our computer. So it'll seem almost instant that that page comes back up. Now, as we browse websites in the address bar and outside of the address bar, we can see this thing called breadcrumbs. And if you, you know, remember the, the fairy tales where they dropped the breadcrumbs so that they could find their way back, that's exactly what we're talking about here. So I've got this great example here where as I browsed a website, it lets me know that I started on the home page, I went to the services subsection, and I'm on the page called web design. So there is an example of breadcrumbs. And that happens down here too. Now this one's a little bit more difficult to understand, but basically if I had google.com and maybe I had a subsection for search, um, then I could have a whack and then subsections of the subsection search. So here I might see search, here I might see database, here I might see images, here I might see audio, things that I'm searching and then specific features and functionalities of searching that portion of the website. So the reason this is here though, is this is representing Internet Explorer and it's showing you a navigation bar. So notice, not only can I utilize the breadcrumbs, but I can use as a forward and a back. So if I've gone back on a website a couple pages, I can then go forward. Um, and forward and back to review the website. So if I have content that is over two pages, I can go forward and back and read that content. Or if I'm out shopping and I look at an item and I'm like, no, I like that item I was looking at last, I can use the back button to get there. So what's this all mean as it pertains to this idea of top level domain? So as we saw in that URL, that uniform resource locator, we start with the protocol, and I'm focusing down here on this portion of the screen, down in the lower right. I start with the protocol. This is HTTPS. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. But we start with that protocol, and from there, we then have the www for World Wide Web. Now, as some of you know, we don't have to put that in a lot of browsers anymore. We can just start typing the domain name, and but let's be assured it's putting the protocol and the World Wide Web in front as it does the pathing to get out to the web. But if you notice at the end of this one called Name Ocean, you see .NET. .NET is that top level domain. So in a web address, the three letters at the end, or two letters if it's a country designation. So you know we might see .gov, .us, for example, okay, or us.gov, sorry, for a country code as part of the complete URL. And then the domains or subdomains within there. So we know when we type in www.google.com, if we look at our chart here and look at .com, .com is a company or a commercial organization. For you here, if you're in an educational institution, those use .edus, .info, .jobs. And by the way, this is like the high end the top ones here, the old ones that we used to use, you know, like .mobi, you know, for mobile products and services. Museums have theirs. And then, by the way, we can now buy pretty much any unique top-level domain we want. So if I want to be at .me, for example, Eric, um, at .me, we can do that as well. So we talked at the beginning about the standards boards and what it is is standards organizations keep everything in order running make sure that everybody's cooperating on the website that the rules for routing are the same that securing websites is done the same that developing guidelines for responsible internet use all of that stuff that we need to keep the internet or the world wide web I should say both a productive portion of 
life. Okay, so two organizations that do that, Internet Engineering Task Force, they set the standards that allow devices, services, applications, all that stuff to run on the big eye internet and to present data out to us. And then the Worldwide Consortium, it actually has combined of hundreds of organizations and experts that work together to write web standards. So, you know, standards for programming websites, standards for presenting websites, standards for making sure that websites are programmed and developed so that they run in all of the browsers. Okay, it used to be back in the day, if you wanted your website to run an Internet Explorer, you had to have one site that if a browser from Internet Explorer asked for the site, it went to a certain programmed website. If Google asked for it, it went to another program. If Safari asked for it, it went to yet another program portion of the website so that the content would be displayed correctly for the end user. All right, folks, so that's the end of part one. In part two of the web, we will cover topics, identify the types of websites, we'll explain the pros and cons of web apps, major components of a web page, and what it means to, to deal with secure and unsecure web pages. Until then, take care.